As superintendent of a large urban school district, I am well aware of the serious problems asbestos is causing in our 100 school buildings and in the thousands of school buildings across the nation. It will take decades and hundreds of millions of dollars to deal with the asbestos problem. In this program, we will review the characteristics of asbestos, how it is used, the associated health effects, how fibers are released, and how to avoid disturbance. I hope that through your viewing of this program that you will be able to better understand and respond to the asbestos problem in your school buildings with a greater efficiency and effectiveness. This is asbestos. So is this. Actually, these both belong to a group of naturally occurring minerals which we call asbestos, minerals which have been around for millions of years. Each of these types of asbestos has a different chemical makeup, but common to each is their fibrous structure. They are all made up of millions of tiny fibers. As we'll see, these fibers have special properties which make asbestos an ideal material for many unique applications. Like coal, gold, and many other minerals, asbestos occurs as veins embedded in the rock. Also like coal, asbestos is mined out of the ground, either from underground mines or, more often, from open pit quarries. This mine in Quebec, Canada, has been exporting one of the world's largest known asbestos deposits continuously for over 100 years. There are a few mines in the United States but most asbestos is mined from the vast resources of Canada, the Soviet Union, and South Africa. As with many other minerals, the mining of asbestos usually involves blasting to break away large pieces of rock. Then this asbestos-rich ore is hauled to the mill to be crushed, so the asbestos can be extracted during the milling process. Typically, about 7% of the ore can be converted into usable asbestos. The quality of asbestos is graded according to fiber length, in much the way that cotton and wool fibers are. Longer fibers provide greater strength and are more desirable. But that's not the whole story. These visible fibers can be further broken down into smaller and smaller fibers, which are not visible to the naked eye. When we look at asbestos under a high-power microscope, magnifying it thousands of times, we can see that each fiber is itself actually a bundle made up of tiny fibrils. In fact, one type of asbestos fiber is so small that a million of them, side by side, would barely measure one inch. In order to avoid breaking up these long fibers during milling, the asbestos fibers are removed from the ore by a relatively gentle aspiration process, where the fibers are separated from the heavy ore by screens which vibrate and shake loose the asbestos. The loosened fibers are then blown up out of the ore, captured and bagged. The processed asbestos can then be shipped to manufacturers for use in many products with a variety of uses. Asbestos has special properties which make it an ideal material for many applications. The three types of asbestos that are most widely used in building and industrial applications are chrysotile, amosite, and chrysotile. These types of asbestos fibers may look very different once they are mixed with other materials than they do in their raw form. Chrysotile, the most common type, makes up about 95% of the asbestos used in various products. Because chrysotile is highly heat resistant, it was often specified and sprayed on fireproofing material prior to being banned from many applications in the 1970s. Also, chrysotile fibers are flexible. This high degree of flexibility and their resistance to heat make these long fibers particularly useful in the production of fireproof clothing and other textiles. Amosite asbestos is not used as much as chrysotile, but it is often applied as an insulation material on pipes, boilers, and mechanical systems. Chrysotile asbestos is the least common of the three. Because chrysotile is highly resistant to acid, it has been used for thermal insulation, gaskets, and lagging where corrosion by acids or other chemicals 
would deteriorate other substances, giving products containing these fibers a much longer service life. Some types of asbestos fibers actually have a tensile strength, a resistance to being pulled apart, similar to that of steel, making them very useful in strengthening certain products, such as cement pipe, woven textiles, and gaskets. Because of these many desirable properties, asbestos has been used in over 3,000 products, from fireman's jackets to the brake shoes on your car. In fact, all forms of asbestos have one or more of these special properties which make asbestos an ideal ingredient for many products. The main categories of asbestos containing products which are found in buildings include surfacing material, thermal system insulation, and miscellaneous material. Surfacing materials include those materials that are sprayed on, troweled on, or otherwise applied to surfaces such as acoustical plaster on ceilings and fireproofing on structural members. This is an example of asbestos fireproofing spray applied to structural members to decrease the possibility of building collapse in the event of a fire. Asbestos containing materials have often been used in spray applied thermal insulation to prevent heat loss or gain within a facility. This material is sometimes referred to as cotton candy insulation due to its fluffy appearance. Although this material has been applied to a concrete ceiling, it may also be found on walls and other surfaces. Here, spray applied asbestos material is serving as a decorative finish and an acoustical insulation to dampen vibration and echo when the room is full of people. Asbestos was often mixed with other materials and sprayed on concrete ceilings pillars and borders to form nice, soft-looking surfaces. Thermal system insulation, a second category of asbestos-containing materials, refers to those materials applied to pipes, fittings, boilers, breaching, tanks, ducts, or internal structure components to prevent heat loss or heat gain or water condensation. This hot water tank has been insulated with asbestos-containing material. The thermal insulation can take the form of preformed blocks or mud wrapped with a canvas jacket. This is a preformed powdery type of insulation on a hot water pipe. Other types of pipe insulation include layered paper, which is often corrugated. It's also used to control condensation on cold water pipes. This type of insulation used on pipe joints and elbows, valves, and other irregular surfaces is typically a packed on or troweled on asbestos containing mud and sometimes wrapped with a canvas jacket. The third category of asbestos containing materials include miscellaneous products such as materials on structural components, structural members of fixtures that are neither surfacing materials nor thermal system insulation. Asbestos floor tile is a typical miscellaneous asbestos containing material that might be found in a building. Not only these floor tiles, but the mastic or glue that is used to cement the tile to the floor may contain asbestos. Asbestos has also been used in ceiling tiles. Although the majority of ceiling tiles installed in the U.S. do not contain asbestos, they should be checked during the building inspection. Because of its high tensile strength, asbestos has been used extensively in the production of cement pipe Asbestos cement pipe is commonly used as water lines, flue pipes, or, as in this case, an air duct. Another type of asbestos material which may be found in a building is woven textile cloth. Asbestos textiles have commonly been used in gasket materials, fire curtains, and fire blankets. Now that we have reviewed what asbestos is, where it comes from, and the qualities that make it such a useful substance, Let's discuss its characteristics which can make asbestos a potential health hazard. While most of these various asbestos products may appear to be stable, harmless substances, they're potentially dangerous because they all contain the microscopic asbestos fibers we saw earlier. Nearly indestructible, highly resistant to heat, acid, and friction, these fibers pose a potential health hazard when they are breathed into the lungs. 
That is of great concern because many of these applications for asbestos are friable. That is, they can be crumbled easily. They have a high tendency to release their asbestos fibers into the air. This asbestos containing transite pipe, for example, would be considered non-friable until it is cut or broken and fibers are released into the air. Because of the higher potential for fiber release, friable asbestos containing materials are of greater concern. These tiny unseen fibers could be easily released by touching or disturbing many of these materials. In addition to the beneficial qualities of indestructibility, high tensile strength and flexibility, these microscopic asbestos fibers are also very aerodynamic. This means that once asbestos fibers are released into the air, they will remain suspended there for long periods of time, sometimes even days. Asbestos fibers can be carried from one part of a building to another just by air movement. Also, air movement can resuspend the fibers once they have settled out of the air. If you've ever seen a shaft of brilliant sunlight reveal dust particles floating in the air of an otherwise clean room, you are looking at particles many times larger than those of asbestos. When inhaled, certain sizes of the small fibers that are visible to the naked eye can bypass the defense mechanisms of the body. Some fibers can get by the tiny filtering hairs in the nose and the hair-like cilia that line the windpipe. These fibers can penetrate into the smallest sacs in the lung, called alveoli, where the critical exchange of oxygen between the lung and blood takes place. Once in the lungs, the indestructible nature of the fiber becomes most dangerous. Some types of asbestos fibers can remain there permanently because the body's defenses cannot break them down. Giant cells, called macrophage, which normally engulf foreign particles such as dust and bacteria and digest them are usually ineffective against asbestos fibers. These cells deposit a coating around the asbestos fibers just as they would a particle of lint, but cannot destroy them. The body then attempts to wall them off by building scar tissue. This accumulation of undigested asbestos fibers and scar tissue in the lung can cause various diseases. If many asbestos fibers are inhaled and much scar tissue is formed by the body in response to the cutting action of the fibers, a condition known as asbestosis, a disease characterized by a fibrotic scarring of the lung, develops. The scar tissue created by the body's repair of these tiny wounds reduces the functional capacity of the lungs and their ability to provide the body with oxygen, resulting in difficulty in breathing. Asbestosis is prevalent among workers who have been exposed to large doses of asbestos fibers over a long period of time. Accordingly, there is a clear dose-response relationship between asbestos exposure and developing this disease. This means the greater the dose of asbestos exposure, the more likely the body's response will be the development of asbestosis. Like all diseases associated with asbestos exposure, it can take many years for the disease to show up. In fact, the symptoms of asbestosis may not be noticed for 15 to 30 years. Asbestosis has been associated with the higher occupational exposures to asbestos and is not likely to occur as a result of exposure to the typically low levels found in buildings. Lung cancer is a malignant tumor of the bronchi covering. The tumor, or uncontrolled cell growth, swells through surrounding tissue, invading and often obstructing the air passages. The earliest symptom of this disorder is often a persistent cough. It should be noted that there are many causes of lung cancer, of which asbestos is only one. Smoking tobacco is another. While employees exposed to industrial concentrations of asbestos in years past have a five times greater risk of getting lung cancer, their risk is not as great as the cigarette smoker who has a 10 times greater risk. However, a cigarette smoker who also works with asbestos is more than 50 times likely to contract lung cancer than the normal non-smoking population. Like asbestosis, 
there can exist a long lag time or latency period between initial exposure and the appearance of lung cancer, typically as long as 30 years. There also appears to be a dose-response relationship between asbestos exposure and lung cancer, although no safe level or threshold of exposure has yet been determined. The asbestos-associated disease of greatest concern regarding asbestos in buildings is probably mesothelioma. Fortunately, it is also the rarest. Mesothelioma is a cancer of the chest cavity lining called the mesothelium. Mesothelioma can also occur in the lining of the abdominal cavity. This type of cancer spreads rapidly and is always fatal. As with many cancers, the exact mechanism of mesothelioma remains unknown, but it is believed to be related to the size and shape of the asbestos fiber. There does not appear to be any increased risk of getting mesothelioma for smokers, and there does not appear to be a dose-response relationship between asbestos exposure and mesothelioma. In fact, cases have been recorded where the person's asbestos exposure has been quite limited, such as secondary exposure to family members from a worker's clothing. Like the other asbestos diseases, mesothelioma often takes 30 to 40 years after initial exposure if it occurs. Because of the long latency period and lack of information about what levels are safe, there is concern about low-level exposures to school children. Several other diseases are found more often among persons exposed to asbestos than the normal population. These include cancer of the esophagus, stomach, colon, and pleural plaques, pleural thickening, and pleural effusion. Available data does not allow us to reliably estimate the actual risk of people in buildings with asbestos-containing materials. Therefore, it is important to follow necessary procedures to reduce asbestos exposure and minimize the occurrence of these crippling diseases. Many school buildings have various types of asbestos-containing materials. However, for the asbestos to pose a hazard, it must release fibers into the air. In many ways, it is like having medicine in a cabinet. When properly handled in a controlled, safe environment, asbestos serves many useful and unique functions. If accessible and misused, it may present serious health hazards. Therefore, we must all work together to recognize asbestos-containing materials and to keep them in undamaged, good condition. Otherwise, asbestos fibers will become airborne and exposure can occur. There are three ways that fibers can become airborne. These three ways are depicted on this chart. Rate 1 indicates fibers released through natural fallout or material deterioration. Rate 2 indicates fibers released through direct contact, such as occurs if a student throws a ball against a ceiling with asbestos-containing insulation. Lastly, rate 3 indicates fibers that become airborne by stirring up settled dust that contains asbestos, such as dry sweeping pieces of pipe insulation that have fallen to the floor in a boiler room. Let's look at a few examples. Some materials which were previously damaged or badly deteriorated can release fibers spontaneously. Here we can see some friable asbestos containing insulation that is literally falling apart. Usually, only very small amounts of asbestos will be released in this manner. However, where a direct airstream exists, or in the presence of a strong source of vibration, the fiber release could be significant. In this boiler room, for example, the strong vibration from the furnace and machinery could cause loose insulation to fall off and get into the air. The second method by which asbestos-containing materials become airborne we called Rate 2. Here, fiber release is caused by direct contact with the insulation material. Usually, this is accidental in nature, but can be intentional. Because accidents are difficult to predict, this form of fiber release is usually the most difficult to control. We all must work together to avoid disturbing these materials. Let's look at a few examples of what could happen. Water damage. A leaking roof or a damaged pipe can cause the binder in these materials to deteriorate rapidly. 
In the worst cases, it can cause whole sections of the insulation to separate from the substrate or fall off entirely. This is termed delamination. Vandalism. Students or others may intentionally damage the asbestos-containing materials. Most often, however, the problem of direct contact disturbing asbestos-containing insulation is unintentional or an accident. For example, a teacher here is only trying to liven up the classroom for the holiday season without realizing that such activities can cause a significant release of asbestos fibers that may take several days to settle out of the air. Students may unknowingly disturb the asbestos-containing materials as well. Even rodents and other animals have been known to cause fiber release as they gather insulation materials to construct nests. One of our greatest concerns, however, is maintenance and custodial personnel who may encounter asbestos-containing materials on a regular basis. They must take special precautions to be sure they do not allow asbestos fibers to be released into the air. Without special training and the correct work practices, problems such as these can occur, exposing himself, others in the area, and even family members at home to asbestos fibers unnecessarily. Even cleaning practices may need to be altered if asbestos dust and debris is involved. Routine vacuuming, dusting, and dry sweeping only stirs up dust that may contain asbestos. Remember that chart we showed you? Well, rate three refers to fibers that become airborne as a result of improper cleaning activities. Renovation activities and building demolition can also cause significant fiber release if not performed properly. Federal agencies, including the U.S. EPA, have laws requiring that asbestos-containing materials be removed properly before a building is demolished. We've just seen several ways that asbestos-containing materials can release fibers into the air and pose a hazard to all of us. Now, let's talk about prevention. Let's look at some pointers on how we can avoid the activities which could lead to the disturbance of these materials. The Environmental Protection Agency published some guidelines in the document Asbestos in Buildings, Guidance for Service and Maintenance Personnel. The booklet offers a common sense approach to avoid touching or disturbing asbestos materials on walls, ceilings, pipes, or boilers. Specific guidelines for avoiding fiber release are as follows. Do not hang plants or anything else from ceilings or hang pictures on walls covered with asbestos materials. Do not pin or hang pictures on walls covered with asbestos materials. Asbestos floor tiles or backing material should not be sanded. In fact, it's against the law. Do not damage asbestos material while moving furniture or other objects. Do not disturb asbestos material when replacing light bulbs or when working near the material. Do not allow curtains, drapes, or dividers to damage asbestos materials. Because improper cleaning can stir up asbestos fibers, certain procedures must be used when cleaning areas that contain asbestos materials. A damp cloth should be used to dust surfaces, not a brush. A wet mop should be used to clean floors, not a broom. In an area which contains asbestos materials, do not use an ordinary vacuum to clean up asbestos debris. A special vacuum equipped with a high-efficiency particulate air filter should be used to capture the tiny fibers which would pass through an ordinary vacuum. Ceilings or walls covered with asbestos materials cannot be cleaned. Do not attempt to brush or sweep them. In this program, we have reviewed the characteristics of asbestos how it is used, the associated health effects, how fibers are released, and how to avoid disturbance. It's now time to walk through the building and review some of the details about asbestos materials in your workplace.
the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, AHERA, was signed into law in October 1986. Under AHERA, the EPA developed regulations to respond to asbestos found in schools. The authority responsible for compliance with AHERA is the Local Education Agency, or LEA. But the responsibility of ensuring this compliance is usually delegated to the AHERA designated person, DP for short. This person is responsible for the implementation of the plan for managing asbestos-containing building materials, ACBM, in school buildings, and for compliance with the federal asbestos regulations. Schools lacking a competent DP tend to have more AHERA violations. As the DP for this LEA, you probably have many questions. We want you to be the best DP possible. And we hope by the end of this video, you will have learned more about your responsibilities. You may already have the EPA's guide, How to Manage Asbestos in School Buildings. But if you don't, call the asbestos coordinator in the EPA regional office serving your state, or the Tosca hotline at 202-554 one four zero four. So what is asbestos? Why did we ever use it? And why are we concerned about it now? Asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral found in rock. After it is extracted, it is milled and grated. The thread-like fibers of asbestos are then used in many products. The ancient Greeks called this the miracle mineral because of its softness, flexibility, and ability to withstand heat. They wove it into cloth. In the late 1800s, large deposits were found in Canada, and industry discovered many uses for it. Brakes and clutches, thermal insulation for boilers and pipes, electrical insulation, fireproofing, reinforcement building materials. Asbestos has been used in thousands of products because it is plentiful, cheap, strong, does not burn, does not readily conduct heat or electricity, and is resistant to chemical corrosion. For these reasons, asbestos proved to be most useful in the construction industry. From 1945 to 1980, commercial usage of asbestos products in the construction industry was common. Construction materials that contain asbestos are referred to as asbestos-containing building materials, ACBM. In the interior of school buildings, materials such as floor and ceiling tiles, cement sheeting, fire doors, and wood.